Welcome back, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. I'm Paul Sidorian, joined by John Strand on the lines via Skype. I've got in front of me a research that was done by Praetorian. Uh, this is our good friend Jabra, uh, John. And you we weren't on this episode Jeremy. of Paul, Se- yeah, Paul Security Weekly. He came on and did an interview telling us about his research that he did. Basically, over 100 pen tests, 75 customers. He said these are the top five ways. And he has a whole top 20 thing. Uh, and you can go read the report and stuff. Basically, he says these are the top five ways in which we're able to basically completely pwn an organization. Not how you got in, but how you completely pwn the organization. And what I want to do is go through these top five things. First, I want you your opinion on the top five things and see if at Black Hills Information Security... These are pretty much in line. I think they are, but John, you tell me. Yes. Yes. Yes, they are. Yeah. This is pretty much playbook. Okay. So now I want to focus the conversation on not so much how we exploit them, because we've spent years, John. You've got whole classes that cover this in excruciating detail about how these attacks work. I want to talk yeah. about on this show, well, how do you how do you defend against it? I mean, if these are yes. really the top five, I mean, if these are the top five ways in which pen testers get in. That means that attackers are using the similar techniques, and in fact, they do. And what can you as an organization do to shore up your defenses in these five ways? What's interesting is with maybe the exception of number five, I don't think you need a, need a vendor solution to, to, to fix these issues. No, you really don't. I mean, if we go, if we start at the top, work our way down, weak domain user passwords. Um, absolutely. We just got off a call with a customer yesterday where their password complexity was eight characters. Mm-hmm. And we have a lot of webcasts where we talk about the NIST Green Book and password complexity in 1984 being established at eight characters. And we shouldn't be using password complexities from 1984. That's just bad. Um, so we recommend to customers that you go to at least 15 characters because it gets rid of landman and things like that. But you also want to get away from passwords like summer 2016, winter 2016, and so on. So long passwords are stronger passwords. End of story. Go to passphrases. It, Life I mean, is a lot better. Can organizations just fix this easily by implementing the domain policy and then they're done? Like, What are the repercussions? There must be oh. if not everyone's doing it, right? There are repercussions. Um, so there's two different sets of re- repercussions. One, uh, three. There's a, doing it technically is possible. In fact, uh, Kent just did a blog post on Black Hills Information Security about this. Uh, so if you go to our blog, it's like the top hit. Talking about how to kick that up higher in a domain. Uh, so that's one little pullback. The second thing is basically service accounts. There's service mm-hmm. accounts for applications and legacy SCADA systems that won't accept anything other than Landman. So and Landman is 14 characters. That's it. That's as high as you can go with, with Landman. Um, but you can actually segment those off using, like, Atom, Active Directory and Application Mode, where you can have those applications kind of off on their own, right? They can have their own policy. They're isolated, locked down, where they can log into. And, and that's a, a, real... a built-in feature to Active Directory? Nope. It's a separate download. I think it's still called that. Uh, but okay. It's called but it's, Active... a, it's a free download from Microsoft or a third party? Mm-hmm. From Microsoft? Um, Yes, sir. Okay. Gotcha. Let me see. I want to make sure it still is Adam. Uh, Microsoft changes their names on things. Mm. Um, but that allows you to take a subset of your domain and kind of create an isolated domain uh, using using Adam. Uh, so that, that helps. That's the other drawback, right? People don't want to break their service accounts. And the third one is just politics. A lot of people freak out whenever they say that they got to have a password that's going to be... Um, that they're going to be, uh, you know, all of a sudden going to 15 characters. So what we recommend is basically saying you have it 15 characters, and then you basically um, allow them to use dictionary words. So it's still upper, lowercase, alphanumeric, special character, but they can use dictionary words now, and that gets them into um, that gets them into uh, passphrases, and those are just far more right, secure. Right. Right. Okay. Well, that's good. And this is a completely, I mean, it doesn't require any budget. It's just time and planning and some user education, which, I mean, does cost money, right? But there's no hard costs to doing this. Yeah, it's 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 a hell of a lot better than trying to sink $300,000 into something. Right. So now the second thing uh, that was on the list uh, was broadcast name resolution poisoning, which is WPAD attacks. Correct. Well, it's more than just WPAD. Oh, um, you also have LLMNR, uh, which is Link Local Multicast Resolution. Um, which okay, so the the way that that works is whenever you send out a request via DNS, uh, it goes out to DNS, and let's say we try to look up Sasquatch56.com, and it tries to resolve it, and then DNS comes back and is like, I have no freaking idea what 
you know, Sasquatch56.com actually is you're weird and you have strange thoughts. Um, <laughs> then your local system will do LLMNR and it'll basically ask the systems that are nearby and they'll say, hey, I'm trying to find this Sasquatch56.com. Does anybody know what this is? And local systems on the same network segment, on the same broadcast domain, will receive that. And if one of them knows the answer, they will then respond. So you got WPAD for web proxy auto detection. That's bad. But then also LMNR is another type of poisoning that you can do. And tools like Man in the Middle Framework and Responder, um, there's a bunch of tools to do this. But Responder, by far and away, is the best at doing these types of attacks. Uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, and you can disable these. You just simply have configuration. <laughs> so it's an active, it uh, active directory policy. You push it out to everywhere and you're done. Now, what are the repercussions of doing that? Uh, there must be because it's on the list. <laughs> You know, I have never once ever seen really? an organization that needed LLMNR, ever. I, I have not seen an organization that's like, wow, that was a really good idea. We had that turn on. Never, never once. It's mm -hmm. just a feature that's been on in Microsoft forever. No, I'm sure that we're going to get hate mail. Yeah, some people like, can say, no, oh, use gonna, that. I'm gonna, I use it in my SCADA network for systems that were developed in 1999. Well, good for you. Update those systems. But, uh, but yeah, a lot of this stuff you can just disable. I got you. Okay, now... Of course, the most tried and true, <laughs> probably popular, is uh, local administrator or pass the hash. Well, I think there's two, two different things here. There are some techniques we can use to prevent pass the hash, and then there's getting rid of the local administrator account, correct? Or you're more likely to use pass the hash against the local administrator account. So right. there's a couple of different things. One, you can't use pass the hash attacks against the local administrator account, uh, the built-in RID 500 account. Anyway, Correct. Microsoft right. fixed that. Oh, okay. So um, that was a fix from Microsoft. Yeah, that's a patch. They patched it. Uh, so the only way you can log in as local administrator is through remote desktop or at the local system. Um, but that doesn't mean that organizations that have alternate administrator accounts can't be logged in with pass the hash attacks. Correct. Because you, right. can. you can. You can still do that. That still works. And what about um, a domain account uh, on the system that's in the local administrator's? Okay, now that's where this gets dicey. Um, so <laughs> I knew you'd have all these answers because this is all in the course where you teach and you yeah. coach your you coach your pen test team on all these techniques, right? No, they're coaching me now. Um, yeah. they're far beyond anything I could do. Um, but with tools like Bloodhound, it gets really interesting because you can have a, a situation where domain users is in the local administrators group. Yes. And Bloodhound from the, the very very solid team at Veris, um, they will that with Bloodhound they can actually scour the entire network. They can identify a system where the user, domain users group, is in the local administrator's group, and then you can pivot and become domain administrator. Yeah, yeah, I, okay. I've heard of that tool before, yep. But you can shut that down, right? I mean, you can stop that machine-to-machine -machine communication for pivoting just by turning on the firewall. Um, so your workstations, turn on your firewall so your workstations can't talk to each other. End of story. Right. Um, you can still pivot, possibly, to some systems, but it greatly restricts the lateral movement that I'm allowed to do. Keep your systems patched. That patch stopped the local administrator mm -hmm. account from being logged in remotely. And uh, look at tools like LAPS. Uh, LAPS uh, from Microsoft randomizes the local administrator account across all of your different systems. Uh, so even if I get one system, not past the hash, but with the standard uh, mm -hmm. password, it doesn't matter. I can't log into that system because every system has a different local administrator password. And now we can stop past the hash attacks, or does that break stuff? Is that a domain setting to nah, stop? If you start shutting down the ability for uh, authentication, um, you're basically going to shut down Landman, NTLM, and NTLM v2 authentication, which maybe will break some things. You want to be gotcha. very careful. I gotcha. I gotcha. Um, the other thing is Mimikatz, right? Clear text passwords found in memory. Um, and, but this was patched by Microsoft, right? Largely, uh, yeah. or then, there's, then a, it, there's a story to all of these, which I think is great. Yeah, but then then it, it still works. Um, so <laughs> this has been one of those things where Microsoft fixes something and then someone comes out with an immediate way to bypass the fix, which is pretty standard, really. Mm -hmm. um, Mimikatz, I have to be a local administrator. you got to stop me from getting that local administrator. Once I get the local administrator, it's just a matter of time before I'm able to do further additional horrid, horrid, horrid things. But yeah, Mimikatz patches the LSAS process, Local mm -hmm. Security Authority Subsystem Service. And what's cool is you can actually shut this down by keeping your system secure, turning on the firewalls, and not granting local administrator to every user in your environment. Almost every time that we run Mimikatz successfully, it's because an organization has their default desktop build. All of their users are local administrators. And it, that's game over very, very quickly. And that's just a bonehead mistake. Uh, so there's no really good no really good fix for, for Mimikatz other than good practice, uh, is what no. you're saying. 
no, yeah, it's going to be good practices in that situation. Um, so that would be that would be my recommendation for gotcha. that one. Now you could monitor for services being started um, and services being created on systems, but still you're going to have this as a vulnerability if you allow somebody to get to local administrator. Now, what's interesting, John? These first four we talked about are all about authentication and authorization. Yep. You can do a lot of these things internal with internal Active Directory settings and some good practices, but to make sure that all your authentication and authorization across your domain, especially if you're 100,000 nodes, you're going to probably reach for some tools to help you with that, right, in these first four. And this, I think, is where you should start to look for budget, right, yeah. to, to get a handle on these first four things because they're the ways that pen testers and attackers use to get at all the good stuff in your environment no, and own you. you. You can get a product, but at the same time, for these first four, I would say, yeah, the first four, um, go. you can go spend half a million dollars on a product, right? Or open up a job requisition for, you know, $170,000 and hire a systems administrator yeah. that knows how to handle all these things and can do more, more ninja -y stuff. Like they should know PowerShell, they should know yes. scripting, they should know Active Directory. Hire people first, technology second. Yeah. But if you uh, don't have the ninjas and you have a hundred thousand uh, network, <laughs> you're gonna want to. You know product. what? I, I, you know, I, I gotta disagree. I, I would say even if you don't have the ninjas, yeah. if you're gonna spend the money on the product, you're still screwed. Right. Um, <laughs> I mean, can know, it, can a product uh, such as CyberArk, uh, Thicotic, Lieberman, uh, those type of identity yeah. and access and privilege identity management can do they help the most out of any other product with these first four yeah. problems? They so do, CyberArk, right? CyberArk, absolutely, mm -hmm. um, without question. But, you know, what's interesting about that is almost every organization that we see that has those tools implemented mm -hmm. have ninjas in their domain team. Um, so it still follows that path. You know, they basically get people that are really, really good. They yep. recognize a good product. They understand what that product does, and they implement it effectively. Uh, I see. So, so yeah, you good. can't just go by, even if you do buy a product to help you with this, you still need the ninjas. There's that whole thing we just talked about with skills, technology, and process, yes. right? You need the skills, technology, and process around authentic and authorization in your Windows domains to be successful. That's like the number one issue I think that organizations have to fix before you start looking at all these other advanced technologies and processes, right? This is like one of the most important things to your security program, I feel. Well, and dude, we also say the same thing about active defense. I mean, you and I have been preaching active defense for mm -hmm. six, seven years now. And to be perfectly honest, we always say, get your house in order first, first before you do these things. Yep. Um, now, the last one is interesting, and I, I kind of twist the last one into the same category as the first four, insufficient network access controls, and what they're speaking to here is network segmentation and the ability of one system to communicate to another and whether or not that should be allowed. I think some of that can be solved with making sure that all your authentication and authorization is in order uh, within your various means, whether it's Linux or Windows, right? That's still the most important thing. It can speak to number five, um, but also I, I think more so number five, the way that uh, Praetorian was presenting it was just sheer network segmentation, like disallowing, not on a local firewall, not on a uh, username and password or credential basis or a service account, but on a physical network segmentation of systems in your environment, which that is, we can debate that, I think. Yeah, I... I I, I think that that you need to have it at the network level without question. And this is where, you know, we haven't talked about them in a while. This is one of those areas where I love Force Scout. Mm -hmm. uh, Force Scout does network access control, though they'll, they'll, they'll hunt me down and shoot me for saying that they're a NAC vendor. Uh, but they're basically what NAC has always promised to be. And there's other vendors that do this as well. But but they basically <laughs> can identify workstations by MAC address, user agent strings, who's currently logged into that system, and they can apply network access control rules on that system regardless of where that system is. That's brilliant, right? That's yeah. awesome. Um, that's great. And you can basically set up that restriction for that workstation regardless of where they're plugged in, and that's cool. But I also think it all goes all the way down to the workstation firewall as well. Your workstation should treat each other as hostile because they are. And you can put in your firewall rules just using NetSH, uh, you know, you're working with mm -hmm. the NetSH advanced firewall command. You can push down some really Okay, there's still crappy firewalls. There's no there's way. There's still crappy firewalls. Dude, there's no way you're going to find a pony in that pile of crap. But uh, it is better than nothing. And if you don't want to use the built-in firewall, there's also Symantec and McAfee. Like, whatever AV you're using most likely has a firewall built into it as well. Turn it on. I find um, it hilarious, John, that I can, knowing you as well as I do for so long, that you're, like, you're so tired of talking about these five topics. <laughs> 
<laughs> I am, right? So, all right. So, you know, it, it's cool. So I, I, we had our biggest webcast ever yesterday. Um, I saw that. I, I did see that. We broke a thousand uh, registrations. Yeah. And 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 that was really 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 cool, and that that was that was awesome. That's something to celebrate. But it was cool to talk about something new and um, talk about new <laughs> not, techniques. Not one of these five things. <laughs> not one of these five things. And then you talk about these things being tired, and not as soon as we're done with it, right? We get this uh, we get this post on our YouTube channel, and uh, it's from uh, Dangerous Health, and he basically says that uh, there was other research that was done. Um, it was released at DerbyCon that was very similar to what we did. It's like, God damn it. Um, and then we did some more research and we saw that there was some more research that was done in 2012 and 2009. Mm-hmm. So even when we think it's something new, it's still crap. We've been yeah. fighting since 2009. Mm-hmm. And, and this is stuff. These five things are things we've been fighting for a long time, which is why I oh, yeah. tired of, tired yeah. of talking let's get, about them. Sorry. I made you I, talk I, about them again, but okay. as was proven by uh, Praetorian, right? And is backed up by John at Black Hills InfoSec. These are still the issues that we're faced with today in an enterprise that pen testers and attackers are picking on in order to gain full control of an environment. These are things that lead to ransomware, right? These are things that lead to sensitive out of an organization. And they're things that... I like what John said, right? This being some super cool technology in all cases. Yeah, technology helps, but largely it's a, it's a process uh, and policy and procedural issue more than anything else. Yeah. Which is, I think, where we fall down the most when it comes to trying to secure our enterprises. Absolutely. We just want the shiny thing that we just push the button and it's secure. The easy button yep. for security. Yep. And, and these are not the easy the button things. The these are these are changing, changing policy and changing the way uh, authentication and authorization works throughout your entire environment, which could be a thousand or a hundred thousand workstations, which is hard. But well, what the reason I wanted to run this, John, is it's freaking important. It's one of the most important things that you do is tackle a project that will deal with these five things. Maybe it's, it's probably multi, it's probably five projects, um, but these are the top ones for me. I don't know. Maybe you agree or disagree. But I think for every enterprise out there, if you're not tackling one of these five things, you got. If you're missing all five, you got five projects to go back and work on as soon as you listen to this show. Uh, and the ones you're not, those are your your top projects. Do you agree? Disagree? Absolutely, I agree. Um, it, it's got to be in the top. I, I would say top two at least. Yeah, I mean, we haven't touched on application weaknesses or anything of that nature, but these seem to be the most common. I think. And it's been a little while since I've done pen testing, but you, you have a job run. You were both backing me up on this. That yeah, no, this is this is what we see. Well, and you and let's be honest. You also see a lot of the reports and a lot of the things that that we do at Black Hills Information mm-hmm. Security. We talk to uh, uh, Larry very regularly, and Larry within Guardians, of course, says these exact same things as well. But uh, now how rare is it though that we actually see someone that actually has good defenses put in place for these? That's another question. I would say it's basically two to three customers over the past two years that have actually gotten this right. Wow. And what's interesting is whenever we talk to them about it, we're like, "Wow, you got these things right." Uh, forced us to do more advanced, some cool ninja <laughs> things. And, and, <laughs> And and what they, do they say? Like, well, what do they say? Like we listen to the show. Universally say, well, yes. That's, they took. They that's they right say two things. I took training with John Strand, and I listened to the show. That's right. Yep. Those are the, the and, their fundamentals, which is us, you know, gloating essentially. But that's a lot of times what we hear uh, from folks. And we don't. I don't want it to be that you have to do that to understand these things. I think they should be out there more. So please share this with everyone. I want it in 2017. I want to see us fix these five things in a more global manner. Absolutely. Because it'll make our jobs more fun, too. Because we don't have to talk about this anymore. That's it right there. That's that's the deal. Is the you know, it's awesome whenever we get into a test and we see these things are actually patched and fixed and it gets us to try new bags of tricks. It gets us to think yep. and brainstorm about more things. And that's that means that security is improving. I would say in a lot of ways it hasn't really improved as much as we'd like to see it improve over the past five years. I agree. And then that's going to force attackers to go after things like IoT systems that they've just been keeping in their back pocket. <laughs> for yeah. now and now they're actually going after him so awesome well thanks so much john and thanks everyone for listening and watching so you got your five projects from this from this segment we'll see everyone next week on enterprise security weekly 